ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mark Lukoch. I came home from work one day and I found my wife sitting on the floor in the guest room and she wouldn't look up at me. And I had learned to read her body language well enough to know that when she wouldn't look up at me, she had something she was really lost in. And finally, after a little while, I coaxed it out of her, what, what's wrong? And she said, I've been thinking about what I'm gonna do with the Vespa key. I didn't know what she was talking about. We have a Vespa, but, and so she said, when I go to the Golden Gate Bridge, I need to take the scooter to get there. And when I jump off the bridge, I don't know what I'm going to do with the Vespa key. I could leave it on the scooter, but then someone might steal it. And I could bring the key with me, but they might not find my body. And then you lose the scooter too. So I've been thinking about what to do with the Vespa key. Now, I had been terrified that my wife might act on her suicidal impulses. I had hid her medication. I changed, I changed the hiding place every few days. But I didn't know exactly how I was supposed to hide the Golden Gate Bridge. I met and fell in love with my wife, Julia, when I was 18. And when you're 18, you don't think about the future very much. And when I thought about it, I thought it was going to be bright and shiny. I didn't think that someday this person that I love so much was gonna get really sick and that she was gonna experience so much pain and that I was gonna spend so much time afraid and worried about whether she would live or die. We married young and we had these incredibly charmed lives and everything started to change when she took on a new job and the stress she had to the work quickly became something much bigger than just normal work stress. It first manifested itself in not being able to sleep at night. And I would try to stay up with her, and I'd try to talk to her, and give her massages, and tell her, just relax, it's okay. And then I'd fall asleep, and I'd wake up, and she'd still be sitting on the bed staring at me, when all I wanted to do was help, and I couldn't do anything. And then one morning when I woke up, she said, God spoke to me last night. And he said, everything's going to be okay, and I'm going to be fine. Which was unsettling to hear, but it was also at least comforting. And then a few days later, I woke up, and she wasn't sitting on the bed. She was frantically pacing around the room. And when I finally cornered her, she said, I spoke to the devil last night. He said, it's not going to be okay. He said, I'm not getting better. He said, I'm not worth getting better. And I didn't know what to do. I was completely over my head. And so I took her to the hospital, and I had to literally grab her. But she was kicking and screaming and trying to grab onto doorknobs in order to get her into the car to take her to the hospital. And once we got there, they admitted her to the psych ward. And let me just tell you, the psych ward is just as horrifying as it looks in the movies with the blank white walls and the bars on the windows and the little cups with medicine. And I visited her every day from 7 to 8.30 during visiting hours. And sometimes she didn't want me to visit. She was scared that if I came close to her, this thing that was inside her might get me too. And so in this perverse way, she was trying to protect me while I was trying to protect her. And I didn't know, I, I didn't know what to do, so I did everything because I thought somehow maybe I could love this thing out of her. Maybe I could say the right thing to her, or I could hold her close enough, or I could ask the right questions to the doctors, and I could somehow make this go away. But the days added up to weeks, and I had realized I couldn't. And the doctors were perplexed. She had no previous hint of a mental illness. And here she was, and as they described her, she was acutely psychotic. So one afternoon before the hospital visit, I went out surfing, and I didn't even really feel like surfing. I just needed to be in the ocean, and I paddled out way past the waves, and I was just kind of sitting in the middle of the open ocean, and I just sat there, and I cried for a really long time, and I asked myself, is Julia going to get better, or is this it for us? Because 
I didn't really sign up for this when I was 18. I don't know if I can do this. And this is going to sound like a cliche, but you have to believe me, this actually happened. Two dolphins swam right at me. And I heard, and they were right there on my right. They swam right under, and they were on my left. I looked at these dolphins, and I thought of how vast and terrifying the ocean is, and I saw them swimming together, and I knew then that if they could do it, so could I. And I was going to stand by my wife no matter what. No matter what, it turned out to be 23 days in the psych ward. And when she came home, she was very heavily medicated, and the medication changed her. It slowed her down. I'd ask her a question, and she'd often have to repeat the question to make sure she understood it. And then her answer was often just yes or no. Um, Some of it actually changed her physically, made her stiff, like arms frozen at her side. And some of the medication led to really rapid weight gain. And the worst thing it did was to her eyes, these beautiful brown eyes that I looked in and fell in love with. When I looked in them now, there was nothing. It was just look, looking in the eyes of a non-person. But, you know, we did what we could. We took one day at a time. We trotted along. We, we tried to tackle the problems we could actually solve. Like, for example, the weight gain. Julia hated the weight gain. And I thought, this is something I can do. I can do something about this. So I found a nearby gym, and I called them. And they're only 10 bucks a month. So I signed us up. And they did group classes. And she loved group classes before she got sick. So we went to our first class, and this gym was 10 bucks a month. It was pretty horrible. Um, <laughs> it had bright red wall-to-wall carpeting and rusted machines and a tanning booth. And it was just, but we went to the class, and I don't even remember what the class was called, but it was basically an aerobics class. And it was all old Chinese women <laughs> and us. And the teacher was an old Chinese woman, and she didn't speak English very well. And I think she mostly made up what she was doing as she did it. So we had no idea what we're just kind of trying to keep up and follow along. And I got to be honest, it was awesome. <laughs> like, it was so much fun because it was just the right amount of absurdity and bizarreness that it could get me out of my life. But the thing was, in aerobics class, I had to do my best to not watch Julia. Because in that class, the, her slowness and the physical manifestations of her illness were most obviously on display. Now, when she was discharged, I took three months off work in order to stay home and take care of her, and I thought three months is going to be plenty of time. Well, she'll be fine. And after three months, I had to go back to work to keep up my insurance, and she wasn't fine at all. She was, you could say, worse, because she was openly suicidal at that point. And so I'd go to work and basically panic all day, And then I'd come home and pretend everything was fine and dance around the house and be goofy and just try to keep keep life light for her and for me. And, And this was our life for months. You know, for months, I was her cheerleader and I was her watchman, but I was also terrified and I was slowly falling apart inside. And for months, the doctors, they... They experimented with so many combinations of drugs and different tweak this and change that and get rid of this and nothing was working. Finally, after nine months, they sat me down and they said, we think it's time we consider ECT. ECT stands for electroconvulsive therapy. And I know that a lot has changed since the 60s and one flew over the cuckoo's nest, But when they said to me they wanted to give my wife shock treatment, that's when I really, I knew it was at the edge. And I once again feared, is Julia ever going to get better? (laughs) But they said, we're going to give it one last try. We're going to give one last drug combination, another shot before we go that route and hope for the best. Two weeks later, we're in that aerobics class. And I look in one of the mirrors, and I see Julia, and she's smiling. You have to understand how rarely she smiled. And I smiled back. And I stopped, and I watched her for a little bit. And she was less slow. She was more in control of her body. She was coming back. 
And I turned and I faced her and I looked in her eyes. For the first time in nine months, I saw life again. I saw this spark of health that we all take for granted so much. And I knew she was going to make it. And I turned back to that aerobics teacher and I kept going so hard. I thought my arms were going to fall out of their socket. I was so victorious. I met and I fell in love with my wife when I was 18. And I had no idea how demanding and scary love is, how much it asks of us. You know, I had no idea she would get sick. And she has bipolar disorder, which is a lifelong illness. It's going to always be part of her. It's going to always be part of me. You know, I didn't think about that this person is going to someday die. I mean, you don't think about that when you're a kid. And I knew that would happen, but I didn't process it. And I now I clearly have a preference for what that looks like. I want us to make it into old age. But ultimately, I don't have that much of a say. My wife's mental illness has added, has added tremendous layers of sadness and uncertainty and fear into our lives. But it's also shown me that there truly is no greater reward than to love someone and to be loved in return. To lose someone into the deepest depths of depression and then to find yourself at aerobics class surrounded by old Chinese women in a room with bright red carpeting and to look into her eyes and then see that she was going to be okay. Thank you.